This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, as Randy reminded us this morning during the Civil War, it was when the Battle Hymn of the Republic was written. And that while most saw the battlefields, the psalmist who wrote that saw the glory of God. And with all the craziness that is going on in the world today, and if you don't think it's crazy, you need to quit drinking or snorting or smoking what you're drinking, snorting, or smoking. Uh, it is crazy. And there is an expectation in my spirit, and it, this has been going on now for probably about a month or so. I'm waiting to pick up in the spirit realm Worthy is he who has been found worthy to open the seals of the scroll. There is, there is a pivotal point that is coming. And I, I think there's things going to boil, boil ahead in America that we may be singing the battle hymn of the republic again. And there's just a lot of things going on. And in this message today, instead of being a Bible teacher, I want to put on my apostolic pastoral hat. Can I do that? Uh, the past two years have been interesting, to say the least. The world and its leaders are drunk on the wine of the mystery religions. We have a planned pandemic with questionable medical protocols that there's no protocol allowed until you're ready for a respirator, and the obfuscation of truth that does not line up with the current agenda that we're seeing constantly. So much so, and one of the ones that I was really taken aback at is we have some dude or dudette working for Facebook that claimed that an article in the American Medical Journal was fake news. Okay? a peer-reviewed article. And we're about ready to see the same thing happen with an article that was recently published in The Lancet coming from Oxford. Anybody ever heard of Oxford? Just a small, unknown school. Very, very notorious, right? Or prestigious. That has found that those that have been vaccinated after two months, that they can hold up to 251 times the viral load in their sinus cavities that somebody unvaccinated does. And this was in a hospital where they, the nurses could not leave for two months in this hospital, so it was a controlled environment. 251 times, that means when they breathe, sneeze, or cough, it is literally a viral bomb that goes off. But we're being told that it's the, those that have not gotten the jab are the, the problem. Uh, in fact, the, the silencing of medical doctors and scientists worldwide is alarming. In fact, I heard a statistic last night that the, the largest group that is resisting the jab 
are those with advanced degrees, like PhDs, in science and medicine. Maybe we should take a clue. It's a time of prescribed social unrest. Cancel culture. Cancel culture is so busy canceling culture, they're even canceling each other out craziest stuff I've ever seen. And there are other agendas in government and corporate world uh, that have been drawn historically from the blueprint of the Marxist revolution. Go back and study the Marxist revolution. Not only were you being silenced from having a public voice, they would shut down your bank accounts. All this is out of the Marxist communist playbook. We're in the middle of a Marxist revolution. And being ex-military, I'm sitting here in Afghanistan and I'm watching a, seem a seemingly planned incompetence of our government and our military in Afghanistan. I, guys, and I heard one general say this the other day. He said, it makes Jimmy Carter look like Rambo on steroids. If I remember the, the Contra incident, okay, uh, within Iran. But it's not by accident. We're the, this terrorist group, middle evil in their ideology, we have left them now advanced military weaponry. I, I got a, had one of my, one of our partners is ex-military, is ex-special forces, and there's these Taliban in U.S. Army uniforms, all of it in the right place, holding brand new M4s. And a military guy, when he's sitting there holding his firearm, his finger will be like this, not like this, Okay. And he showed me a picture of prior to U.S. being there, and every Taliban had their finger on the trigger ready to pull it any minute. And he said, we taught them that. That he believes that many of the ones in the Afghan army that they professionally trained and showed them how to use all that equipment were Taliban all along. That's why one of the most dangerous things that we had for our soldiers over there were the guides and the ones that's supposed to be on our side would shoot them in the back. It was called green on blue uh, violence. It's un unbelievable. But we're looking at it and now it's, I think we're handing into the hands of the CCP for all the precious metals and the great humongous Huge, large, enormous, rare earth mineral deposits that are in Afghanistan. While America was there, they just simply repopulated the poppy fields. But now we're setting it up where China can go in with a well-armed regime to get the minerals. I'm disturbed that in many circles being a patriot or being constitutionally minded is the quickest way to be marked as a terrorist in America right now. says the Marxist, but let's go on. While closing down businesses, our government is proposing to spend money like drunken soldiers or drunken sailors. But looking at what Congress is wanting to do right now, I need to pause and apologize to any soldier or sailor out there that was drunk that spent all their money. Okay. It's going to cause hyperinflation, if not stagflation, in the days ahead. Because America, we have a limited amount of wealth. We also have a limited amount of wealth that we can borrow from China. That we paid them for the goods that used to be made in America. I ran across another statistic that is alarming. The interest, the interest that we pay on our national debt to China pays the entire military budget for their nation. So our debt is funding their military to eventually attack us. Uh, guys, if there was ever something, you know, in the Ozarks we have this expression, stuck on stupid. That's stuck on stupid. But we took one of the hottest economies in the history of our nation and shut it down for something that had a 99.6 percent survival rate. And I've been hearing from people all over America, guys, and then I, I usually average about 1,500 emails in a daytime, in one day. And the reaction of many that I'm hearing across the nation has been fear. 
I was listening to uh, one show when they were going out interviewing people about the pandemic, and they ran across this one guy that was Jewish. Now, if anybody that was ever Jewish would say this, I could have bet you money that it would have never have happened. This Jewish guy was calling for concentration camps for those that refused to be vaccinated, as well as sewing a star or something on their clothing to identify them in public. And I'm thinking, have you not heard of the Holocaust? But fear shuts down logic and the rational mind. And that's what they're trying to do. We are not moved by fear. We are moved by faith. We're moved by the Word of God, yet everything they're doing is programming us to be moved by fear. But let me tell you something. When you step outside of fear and start moving in faith, you step outside of their control. And the only thing, God willing, that can change this around in our nation is faith. Faith in God, faith in His Word. And until we start moving in that direction, there is no hope. Come on. You think there's going to be a solution come out of Washington? If you gave them the solution, they would look at it and do the opposite. Guys, it is time for us to examine where we are exactly in our kingdom journey. Now, Abraham is the prototype. We always, in fact, I've, I've heard theologically, and this is so inaccurate, it's, it hurts my mind, is... You know, in the New Testament, in the, in the Old Testament, it is Gahal, the, those that are called out. In the New Testament, it's Ecclesia, and therefore it's a different group. It's tomato, tomato, because when you read the Septuagint, when they, have, and when they, when they mention assembly, it's called Ecclesia. We, did, we, we just so bad don't want to be related to anything that is Jewish, but we serve a Jewish Messiah. There's, there are paradoxes going on in the body of Christ. But both Ecclesia and Gahal means those that have been called out. And one of the things you need to realize, you can't enter into anything until you understand what you've been called out of. It's impossible. Now the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 16 He's looking at Abraham as the template for both Jew and Gentile. Okay? For this reason it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be granted to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And as it is written, the father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In hope against hope he believed. Underline that in your Bible. In hope against hope he believed. When there was no hope, he believed in hope. When everybody said it could not be done, everything in the physical said that it could not be done, Abraham looked at God and said, God's going to get her done. That's another Ozarkian expression. You know, the, in, 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 like if you would go to synagogue and they would say, Shalom Halakim, their response is, Halakim Shalom. There's, there's a proper response. And so if anybody asks you if you got her done, you see, I got her did. That's the proper response in the Ozarks. Just so that we're linguistically talking on the same page. God can get it done when no one else can. And those who have faith in Him are the ones who accomplish the impossible. Okay. So in hope, against hope, he believes so that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Not being weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. Now as good as that, since he was about 100 years old, Mary, when we get 100, I, I want you to know right now I'm not having another kid. I'm not doing it. We'll just leave that to Abraham. Of course, Sarah had servants. 
And all the women said, that's right, okay. Um, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. He did not waver in unbelief. He did not waver in unbelief. In the Greek, it literally says, he did not waver in unfaith. Anti-faith. You see, there's an antichrist and there's an anti-faith spirit that's trying to take hold of America right now. And it's really hitting hard the body of Christ. He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that God had promised he was able also to perform. Therefore, it is also credited to him as righteousness. I believe what Jesus did for me, a price that I could not pay, and it's credited to me for righteousness. But in this same vein, every time that we believe God, when God has said, but the world says this over here, and we believe God, heaven recognizes that as a righteous act. That we believe God over Mystery Babylon. It says, not only for his sake only was it credit, uh, written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it was, uh, to whom it was, uh, to whom my bifocal, trifocals were fighting me. Nobody ever has that problem with their young, do they? To whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who also was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. I say, listen, Abraham is the template. Now, I, I want to I start this out real simple. Abraham, when he started, wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Hebrew. He was a Gentile. He lived in Babylon. And to make things worse, can it be worse to be a Gentile and living in Babylon? His family business was making the idols of Babylon. And so in the midst of daddy's shop filled with all these idols, Almighty God walked up to Abram and said, I'm the only God. Come follow me. I want to get you out of this mess. Where are you going to lead me? You'll find out when you get there. <laughs> That's just the way God does. Barry and I are feeling, you know, feeling it with this building remodeling. Where, you know, this, the things are starting to come into clarity. But when he told us to do it, well, Lord, what's it going to be used for? You know, I'm not really a pastor and I'm, I'm you know, not, you know. <laughs> And God says, you'll find out when you get there. <laughs> okay, obedience is better than sacrifice, you know. Seeing it now, excited about it now, seeing it come to fruition now. Many times when he's leading us someplace, you only know it when you get there. Why? Because you can't wrap your head around it. Where you are right now, you can't wrap your head around it. Does God have a solution for America? Yeah, but right now you can't wrap your head around it. You just got to believe. You just got to believe. Now the first thing God did, I got to call you out, Abraham, or Abram, because he got a name change later on after he matured. He had to earn the name. He had to earn the name. Go. Can I stop there? If you ever read in the book of Revelation, there are those that are going to be given a little rock with God's pet name for you on it, and nobody else knows it between you and God. You know, hopefully mine ain't fluffy, but... Uh, you, as to those that overcome, you earn the name. There's a lot of you right now may say, the name that God wants to give me is not the name that I deserve. It's not the name that I could carry now. Because if you could look at the rock, it may say victorious. And that's the last thing you feel right now. But when you walk with God, you'll grow into it. 
there was a point that Abram could no longer be called Abram and had to be called Abraham because he became the man that God saw sitting in Babylon of what he could be. And there's a lot of us that there's the man or the woman that we could be that we cannot wrap our head around that God's trying to get us there. But he's got to get us out of Babylon to get us to where we need to be. You know, not only was Abram the first member of God's assembly, first one called out, he was also the first prophet in the Old Testament. God came and talked with him, showed him things to come. I'm getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What do you think about that? Well, Lord, I got family there. And so, you know, if by chance you could find a hundred righteous, would you just kind of... He finally whittled down and said, if you could find ten, God couldn't find ten, but God loved him so much he took his family out anyway. That's a prophet walking with God. Who was the first apostle? Well, I say, was it Matthew? Was it, his name was Moses. One sent from the presence of God to go get a job done. Moses. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, or 23, 32. Blowing my glasses this morning. Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 12. I can't blame it on coffee because I had some this morning. It says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. And this is how the ESV, which is actually when we, when we understand what we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually settles a controversy here. That at the Tower of Babel, God divorced all humanity and said, you want these fallen beings, these principalities, powers, and rulers to be your gods. You can have them. They can have you. Okay. But God says, but, verse 9, but, 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 but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his lauded inheritance. Now, why did he say Jacob instead of Abraham or Abram? Because everybody can identify with Jacob. I want a blessing. I got a help a blessing. Oh, don't leave me out. I want a blessing. I got to have something. And I'll connive and I'll cheat. <laughs> I'll... I'll Put hair on my arms and make my blind daddy think I'm my brother? Come on. When you look at Jacob, Jacob means surplanter. But a surplanter touched by God can become a prince of God. That's why God uses Jacob here. And out of Jacob, when the conniver, the surplanter, was touched by God, what God did on the inside of him was actually even greater than Abraham because it had to explode in 12 sons to become a nation. Oh man, there's a lot of good preaching I could do right there. You see, you don't know what's in you until you allow you get to the place where God touches you. And then you find out what your new name is. But he goes on, he says, listen, I'm going to call out from Abram, I'm going to find one guy, one guy in all of Babylon, I'm going to pull him out and I'm going to make a nation out of him. And that nation is mine. And guess what? We were grafted into that nation. In fact, the only true way to get into that nation is not by DNA, is by the blood of Christ. Okay? And it says, He found him in a desert land in the howling wasteland of the wilderness. He encircled him and he cared for him and kept him as the apple of his eye. 
Look at the next one. Like an eagle that stirs up the nest that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them and bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him, and no foreign god was with him. When Abraham left Babylon, he didn't put a Baal in his pocket just in case. He refused to be led by anything else. And right now in America, we are in that moment that the eagle is stirring up the nest. What does that mean, Mike, stirring up the nest? Get out of here! Get out of here! Well, what the mama does is when she first makes that nest an eagle, now the bottom of it will have thorns and all kinds of stuff, but she'll put bits of fur and leather and all kinds of stuff and I mean, Mike Lindell couldn't come up with a mattress topper like that eagle will put in that nest. And boy, them, them little eaglets, boy, this is comfy. All I got to do is ring the dinner bell. Mom, here comes dinner. And mom says, you know what? You're about old enough. She pulls out the Mike Lindell topper out of that nest. And now they're setting on thorns. I'm getting the urge to fly. I want out of here. This is as much as my blessed assurance can accept. I need to spread my wings a little bit. And for a while they'll try. And it's like, I'm going to fly. And about right there, mama catches them and carries them back up again. You're, you're going to get it. This time, flap them wings. This time, use some faith. Believe that the wings God gave you can hold you and lift you above the storm. And hopefully they, she had a lot of smart little eaglets that about the third time they spread their wings and learned how to catch the wind. And God said, that's what I did with Abram to get him to be Abraham. Abraham. You see, there was a process. There was a famine in the land, and instead of believing God, he went down to Egypt, and he was so scared of the Pharaoh that he uttered the words that, are, that will go down in infamy that any husband has ever said. She is my sister. <laughs> Guys, don't ever do that. God said, visited the Pharaoh and said, no, she ain't, and I'm closing up the womb of your household, and your dynasty is done unless you let him go. But it was, okay, let me ruffle up the nest. And Abram went, caught by the wings of God. And we see God doing that over and over again until he gets to the place that Sodom and Gomorrah is taken by the armies of four kings. And when he hears about it, he uh, says, boys, get your stuff together. We're fixing to go back and get in our kinfolk. And his household took on the armies of four kings and vanquished them. And when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah said, we're going to give you all this wealth and all that, Abram refused it and said, let no man said that he made Abraham rich except Almighty God. And it was shortly after that Melchizedek came and showed him the secret of the bread and the wine. They had the Lord's table. Jesus showed up and said, listen, things are about to change. God comes and gives him a new name, Abraham, and it was Abraham that was willing to offer up Isaac, his only son of promise for God, that opened the door that Almighty God could give his son for humanity on the exact same mountain. And I think if we could do a geotagging on where the altar was that Abraham built, I think right dead center of you will find one day there was a cross that was planted at that exact same spot. The journey and God throwing you out of the nest and letting you free fall for a while. 
I mean, I mean, you're feeling the breeze in your hair, brother. And then catching you, he's teaching you to become something more. Now, I want to go to Genesis 17, 1 and 2 because our Gentile ears and our Gentile Bibles make this, you know, I always read this and it was one of those holy cow Batman type of things. It just didn't fill me full of joy. It's gulp when you read it with Gentile ears. Okay, now he's 99 years old and God appears to him. I am El Shaddai. I'm everything you're ever going to need. Okay. Walk before me and be blameless. Okay. I'm going to be everything you need. You better get your act together. You better straighten up. You better spit and polish. You better do everything perfect because I'm here right now. Is that the way it reads to you? I looked at that and I thought, man! What do I get out of this? I'm going to establish a covenant between you and me and I will multiply you exceedingly. Yeah, if I can survive. The perfect God, the most righteous, holy God, that when angels see him, they eat dirt. And they're not talking about their holiness. They're talking about his holiness. Isaiah got a glimpse and said, I'm undone. I got my eye on you, boy. You better straighten up, fly right. Do you know in the Hebrew, that isn't what it says at all. Not one bit. In fact, it uses three specific Hebrew words. Halech, panim, and tamim. You say, well, what does that mean between that and the, you know, what does that mean? Halek is, come walk with me. In fact, whenever you talk with a Jewish person, they will talk about their halakha, how to walk with God. I'm going to teach you. I'm, gonna, I'm coming beside you. This is almost similar to the same promise that Jesus gave his disciples that the comforter is coming, the parakletos is coming, and he's going to be in you, and he's going to walk with you, and he's going to teach you whatever you need to know, and he'll comfort you if you need comforting. He'll whip your blessed assurance if you need a little spanking. He'll show you things you don't know. Come on. Everything that Abraham got in that journey and that promise is now manifested in the new covenant. And it's available to every believer. God says, I'm here. You're now under my blood. I've translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of my dear son. You're no longer under their jurisdiction. I'm your God, you're my people, you're my nation, you're my peeps, okay? I'm going to lead you, I'm going to guide you. Quit acting like you're under their jurisdiction, you're under my jurisdiction, you're functioning in my kingdom. And I'm here to walk with you. What did Jesus do for those three and a half years that he was with his disciples? He walked with them and he taught them. Sometimes he rebuked them. Prayed with them. Did you ever worry? I've had people write me, Mike, I'm just worried I'm not saved. I'm just, I'm just real worried I'm not saved. Mike, I'm sure you come across that. My, I said, has the Holy Spirit after gotten after you and corrected you? Well, yeah. Well, guess what? According to the Word, you're not a bastard. You're a son. Your daughter. Daddy corrects you. That's proof that he's daddy. Okay? But with his correction always comes encouragement. There's never condemnation. 
I've had a couple times God to me come, has come to me and said, wasn't that stupid? Yes, sir, it was. Will you do it again? I ain't ever doing that again. Okay. He's come to walk with me. Panim in my face. So this, this is a personal. Halech panim. Come walk with me in this face-to-face -face relationship. How many know that anytime there's a distant relationship, the relationship grows cold? That's why when you get married, you leave father and mother and you move in and you, your wife and you get together and you establish your own household because it's a face-to-face -face relationship. And out of that relationships, the ups and downs, the blessings, the rough places, all of it brings you together. And you know one another. I can, you know... I've always had this constant cough, and it used to be it's for my allergies, and, and uh, that's how Mary used to find me in Walmart. She, she knew my particular, <clears throat> I could be on the other side of the store, she'd know exactly where I was. Why? We're so familiar with one another, we know what to expect in every situation because we have learned the ways of each other. That's what God's talking about here. Come walk with me. I will teach you my ways. I will teach. And it gets to the place. Now, the, now you know when God ruffles your feathers, if you will, you know what to expect and you know it's for your good. Because a rut is simply a grave with the ends kicked out. Okay? If I'm not changing, I'm dying. I'm supposed to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. And he's building his, his walk with me line upon line, precept upon precept. Okay? I'm growing in him. I'm changing in him. I'm becoming more like him. The more I hang with him, the more I start thinking like him. That's how you, how, you know, the, the mind of Christ is not some mystical thing that you just, one day and you're walking around and you go, I got the mind of Christ. It's because you spend so much time in his word and so much time in fellowship with him, you start thinking like Jesus. That's what he's talking about here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this face-to-face -face relationship with you. But the icing on the cake. Now that's good. Almighty God's going to come and walk with you. I mean, you can't help but be blessed if God's walking with you. If God is for us, dude, who could be against us, okay? But the icing on the cake is tamim. Because it's literally, remember when Jesus said, come and follow me and I will make you disciples of men. I will make you, I will make you, I will make you. That's the call of Abraham. Because tamim means to be complete, whole, sound, entire, wholesome, unimpaired, having integrity, living entirely according to truth. So, here's the perfect version of you, and here you are way, way, way over here. I'm probably off screen right now. And God says, you walk with me, and you don't go to the right hand or to the left, but you keep walking with me. I will make you become that which you can only become with me, and it will be wonderful. That... <coughs> it's the promise of God. In fact, I have it here now that I, was, I said, if you take what God told him, God is saying, I now want you to walk with me, and as you do, I will make you entire, complete, and sound, and have complete integrity. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an offer you can't refuse. And if you do, you're stuck on stupid. We also need to understand that the strength of faith comes in the journey, not through the association. You say, Mike, what do you mean about that? The Laodicean system, my pastor super powered. He's got a cape he keeps tucked into the back of his suit coat. I saw him one day, he took off his shirt and there was an S right there on his t-shirt. And because I'm associated with him, I'm going to be okay. Or, I'm, a, I'm in a part of the biggest denomination, 
that the world has ever seen. I'm seeing a lot of denominations running off the rail. Instead of being awakened to righteousness, they just gone woke. There are a lot of people trusting in their denominational allegiance that will forever burn in a devil's hell. You know, I look at my task here in America, and I know that we're doing things outside the United States, and we have people in Australia, and guys in Australia, New Zealand, man, we're praying for you. Sure wishing you had the Second Amendment and the Constitution like we do here, and we're having to defend that here like crazy. But I, I look at the mission field, I think there are more Christians that need to be saved almost than there are sinners that need to be saved. I don't listen a lot to John MacArthur, but I remember reading one of his books, and he was talking about the Baptists, and he, he is a good Calvinist, said, here's the problem with the Baptists, 98% of them aren't saved. I mean, that'll slap your mama, okay? Because you don't hope in organizations. The only individual that you hope in is in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The Son of God, Almighty God, come in the flesh. And it's His work, and it's your relationship with Him. Well, how do, you, how do I know? How deep is my relationship in Him? How much fear you got right now? Oh my, it's pegging off the side of the meter. Well, perfect love or matured love, that matured love walk with the Creator, with your Savior, casts out all fear. And if you're a fear reservoir, you're not matured in that love relationship with Almighty God. We need to ask ourselves, how big is God in our eyes? Because perception is everything. You know, that's why Hollywood is, doesn't care about truth. The news media doesn't care about truth anymore. Is, are you shocked to that? Washington, D.C. doesn't care about truth. What they care about is perception. So now running through the streets and burning down cities can be patriotic. It's mostly peaceful. Stuck on stupid. I just recently saw with everything going on in Afghanistan and you have uh, the Taliban lifting up their weapons. Death to America! Death to America! You have a news reporter saying they're chanting death to America but they seem to be nice guys. <laughs> as they're going and killing and raping women all across that nation. They seem to really be nice guys. Perception. Perception. You can... I am going to deal with this. Remember when in Genesis 1-2 where there was chaos? You know, when the, the, the chaos was loosed on the planet. One of the words, tamim, tamim notes... Tohu and bohu. Tohu. I'll get it. Yeah, I'm, no notes going from memory. Slow computer this morning. Tohu can also be defined, if you look it up in a decent Hebrew lexicon, it can mean unreality. That unreality took hold on planet earth. When Jesus said, I have come that you may know the truth and set you free, the Greek word there for truth also means reality. The enemy will skew your perception to unreality. There's nothing real about it except to you. Jesus comes along and he says, when I set you free, I'll readjust your vision so that you see things through my eyes, and that's reality. Okay? And this, we're coming, and I'm going to start here in Matthew 17, verse 14. This is a situation that this young boy had a demon. And all 12 of the disciples lined themselves up trying to cast it out. It wouldn't go. 
And finally, Jesus shows up. So that's where we come on the scene. And said, and when they came to the crowd, a man came to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, for he is a lunatic and is very ill, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And so Jesus lovingly looks at his disciples and says, this paraphrase from Mike Lake, You're, uh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long am I going to be with you? How long am I going to be stuck with you? How's that for talking about your main crew? They tried to get her done and didn't get anything done. And can you see them? Oh, Matthew, you don't have the whammy today. You just step over to the side. I'm feeling kind of anointed right now. <laughs> Nothing happens. Next one, ah, get out of the way. It's my turn. I've never seen this not work. Why? Because before I do it, I go... Can, can, guys compete like that. You know, you know what I mean? And Jesus says, man, how long am I going to be stuck with you like this? You, you don't think. And then he goes, and then Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him. And the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came privately and said, What happened? Why couldn't we drive him out? And he said, because of the littleness of your faith. This particular demon, you needed this much faith, and you had this much faith interswirled with a lot of personal hubris. I tell you what, I got superpowered sandals. You know, Jesus gave them to me. He gave me the whammy. No, you don't get the whammy. You have to have the greater one living on the inside of you. Come on. And he said, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and you say to a mountain, okay, how many know a mountain's big? In Missouri, we have things called mountains, but they're not mountains. I have been... To the mountains. I have been to the Rocky Mountains. I am well, inter I, I well am familiar with the Tennessee mountain range, the Appalachian Mountains. I had to cast a demon one time out of a GPS when I was going to Cleveland, Tennessee. You know, when you're going down the road, the screen on the GPS is not supposed to be spinning. And when it stops, the road is here and it's showing you over here. So I pull over, I reboot it, and it decided to take me on the road from hell to Cleveland, Tennessee. And it took me straight up the Appalachian Mountains on this one jaunt that, would, that I think had something like 60 hairpin turns. I could see the back end of my car as I was coming around the other side. And when you come around, there was no guardrail and the trees were this big. I got up to the top and I got out of the car and I kissed the ground. Free at last, free at last, glory to God, free at last, straight road. I called them, they said, you know, that's the most dangerous uh, road in all of America and especially those mountains and they laughed. I wasn't laughing. Now, Jesus said, if your faith is this big, you can move that mountain. How big was he in, in contrast? Can you hear his disciples? The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. And if they had known what the quantum level is, they're saying, my faith is a quantum dot on the, on the face of reality. If that itty bitty seed can move them out, and I couldn't cast this demon out of this boy. But then Jesus utters, but this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So which is it comes out, the demon or the doubt? See all the above. Because what is prayer and fasting about? Drawing closer to God. 
It's not so that you can get your Iron Man armor on and power up your reactor. It's so that you get so close to God that God in you is bigger than the mountain before you. And when that, that happens, that mountain moves. And it's by relationship that is built in the journey. Now Jesus comes up to the Father, you know, he, and I'm going to read this out of Mark 9, because there are some things that are shared a little bit differently. Because Jesus talks to him and says, uh, if you can, all, you know, if you can believe, then all things are possible to he that believes. Okay. I'm supposed to cast out devils. I'm supposed to be victorious. I'm supposed to be triumphant. I'm supposed to expect God to heal my body. I'm, I'm supposed to expect God to, to heal my son. And the devil at the same time is yelling in my ear, you're not worthy to get it. And you're telling me that if I have faith this big, I can move a mountain. But what was the Father's response to Jesus? Immediately, the boy's father cried out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe in Jesus, I do believe, but somewhere I've gotten sidetracked. I followed preachers. You know, Jesus, you know the Apostle Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. And he's actually painting a picture in the Greek. And it's, it's like, okay, I'm following the Apostle Paul. And he said, you keep following me as long as you can see Jesus over my shoulder. And we have gotten so enamored with the ones that we have followed, we never checked over their shoulder. We got so lifted up in pride that we're part of so-and-so association or so-and-so group and that we put our hope in their theological accurateness that we didn't stop to see if we could see Jesus over on the other side. You see, one of the churches, Jesus said, listen, I mean, you've done some really awesome stuff. You've not, you've not tolerated Jezebel. You've not tolerated Baal. You have stood up, you've endured, and you've maintained sound doctrine, Ephesus. But you lost your first love. Your first love is I'm just in love with Jesus. I just want to know him. I want to know him more. I want to walk with him more closely. The same God that we see in the prophets when the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. Now they have been doing that ever since creation. R.W. Sproul, in, in teaching on this, he says, if you understand the dynamic, that by the time they finish holy, 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 they see a new, greater aspect of God they had never realized before that causes them to start all over again. And when they finish that, they see another aspect of God all over again, all over again, all over again, all over again. And the Apostle Paul has the audacity to say, the fullness of the Godhead, the God that Solomon said the universe itself is not big enough, enough to contain fit in the body of one named Jesus. Jesus was bigger on the inside than he was on the outside. For all you Whoites, he was the original TARDIS, okay? He's, he was bigger on the inside. That which the universe could not hold, the body of Jesus held because God designed it that way and he poured himself through the incarnation into physical form to save us and to have relationship with us. And that is the one that I am called to walk with. And so one of the heart cries that we need to have right now is, Father, I believe, but you got to help my unbelief. Because I can cast out devils, but politicians are like deacons. You can't cast them out. you got to vote them out if you have a fair system. And so what I'm needing is I'm needing heaven to move. I'm needing you to break this techno-sorcery slumber that the world is stuck on and to get them off the wine of Babylon for the sake of your great name in this nation 
And guys, I'm speaking to those in Australia, those in, in whatever nation you're in. Jesus has a plan for your nation. And the devil has a plan for your nation. And what's in the balance is what is his people going to do. Are we going to believe? And say, listen, I, I've, I've read in your word. Ain't nothing you can't do. You stood in nothing and made something. In fact, not only did you make something, you made the, the something was everything. There are galaxies beyond that which we can count that came into existence when he said, light be, and he created. And one of these days, they're going to be gone like that when he says, I'm done with it. I'm going to roll up the heavens like a scroll, and I'm going to set it on fire. That's who we deal with. But in the journey, how big is our God? Do we still need to have eye salve that we might see? Are we still seeing with the lenses of Babylon or the lenses from heaven? Right now we're at a place where we need to get real honest with God. I don't want to be lukewarm in Laodicea. I want to be on fire for God. And I want to maintain that fire until he comes. And it's going to cause us to begin asking some hard, honest questions that nobody can ask you but you. And to say, Lord, I'll be honest. I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. I still got some unbelief here I'm trying to work on. And Holy Spirit... Have a field day. I'm inviting you. I know it's your promise, but just in case you didn't know, I'm setting open the. I'm setting out the welcome mat, and I'm opening the door. I'm giving you the key and saying, "Come on in, make yourself at home, and you have the right to rearrange the furniture any way you want. Change out the furniture. Change out my decorations." I want you to feel home here. When we do that, there's a better you waiting to be released. Not only if you're younger. One of the things Mary and I pray for all those that are part of our fellowship and, our, and that are our partners that are of uh, what we call silvers, you know. That's when the silver starts setting in. Renew our strength, renew our youth. Let our latter years be far greater in your kingdom than the earlier years and restore our strength that we can serve you. That's got to be it. For him the glory. Where are we right now in our journey? Are we still on the path that God set us on? Or are we wandering out with the little buffalo somewhere? On this little side thing the devil ended up tricking us and we got on and we forgot about the journey. He gave us a placebo. Return to the simplicity of faith of taking the hand of Jesus and walking. He'll get you to where you need to be, America and New Zealand and Australia and Europe and any other nation. And God can do it in China just as easy as he can do it anywhere else. And one of these days, he is going to rule the whole kit and caboodle, so he might as well start now, taking it one heart at a time. Now, Father, give us the grace to be honest with ourselves and honest with you. Because we're getting to the place where our eyes are going to begin starting to behold the glory of God. And there's righteous causes going to begin raising up in every nation. And Father, give your people the grace to move in heaven's power and heaven's purpose and show the love of Christ by warring to save the souls of humanity that's going to hell. We ask in Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival.
Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principalities' wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end-time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's Kingdom intelligencebriefing.com Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.